years back, we made a video about the video game vehicles so rubbish we would rather walk. Several commenters on that video informed us that in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Leonardo da Vinci's wooden battle tank is actually rubbish on purpose. Because it is historically accurate, because the real da Vinci deliberately designed it to be rubbish because he was a pacifist. Which sounds like the kind of excuse you would make if you had designed a rubbish tank, but okay. Other commenters on that video had their own beefs with various other subpar video game vehicles on account of those vehicles being slow or hard to maneuver or constantly exploding. So now it's time to pass judgment on these seven video game vehicles so terrible we prefer to get out and proceed on foot, suggested by the commenters on our last video. And also to beware spoilers for the following games. Mass Effect's Commander Shepard is no stranger to terrible driving experiences, having spent an amount of time behind the wheel of the M35 Mako, the planetary rover that's named after a powerful shark and handles like a drunken rhinoceros. Even so, Shepard must have been dismayed by the M44 Hammerhead, as suggested by commenter Dreadhunter335. The M44 Hammerhead is an infantry ground vehicle that has all the breezy drivability of the Mako and none of the wheels. This prototype vehicle is part of Mass Effect 2's Firewalker DLC, in which Shepard visits the volcanic planet of Ziona, where you discover the Hammerhead sitting in a cargo container. Welcome to the M44 Hammerhead Infantry Fighting Vehicle. This is your onboard VI. So begins a series of vehicular platforming levels in which you come to understand that the Hammerhead is a hover tank that's not good at hovering or tanking, but at least it does catch on fire easily. The Systems Alliance gearheads didn't fit this tank with a biotic shield, so all that stands between you and mission ending total destruction is a layer of armour made of tissue paper. But hey, they did give you a cockpit alarm that lets you know you're about to be blown up, which you will be hearing, I estimate, 80% of the time. Oh, and also the Hammerhead has the ability to hoover up resources like a giant Roomba, except Roombas don't slip and slide around on top of the thing they're meant to be hoovering up for no reason. All in all, it's enough to make you miss the Mako. Good times. Look how pathetic they are. I don't have time for these humans. Back in the mid-noughties, where games had to be darker and edgier, Sega's top minds identified the things that Sonic the Hedgehog was missing. One, guns. Two, motorbikes. Perhaps sensing even then that giving their family-friendly mascot a submachine gun was a big swing, they went and created a gritty spin-off game named and starring Shadow the Hedgehog. Like Sonic's black and red Tyler Durden, Shadow the Hedgehog was a brooding lone wolf type fueled by rage and new metal. It was a different time. Where Sonic was pure of heart, Shadow was an amnesiac bad boy who did what it takes to get the job done, including shooting people. As noted by commenter Lily Katrin, Shadow also had access at various points in the game to a motorcycle. As also noted by Lily, this motorcycle drives at considerably less than Shadow's actual running speed. You don't need me to tell you that motorcycles are only cool if they can go faster than you can run. And when you're the ultimate life form wearing a pair of rocket shoes, you can run pretty darn fast. 
That's Strike 1 against the motorbike, and for Strike 2, it provides only minimal protection from damage by Shadow's many enemies. As a dangerous bad boy with no fear of death, Shadow wouldn't care for his own safety. But as a player, no one would blame you for sticking with the rocket shoes. Hey, what up, Z? Nothing is up, Carl, apart from my blood pressure and the imminent collapse of my hopes and dreams. Why? As usual, the forces of darkness have triumphed over good. Life is nothing but misery, briefly interspersed with agony. Homie, what you own? Whatever it is, you need to reduce the dosage. We all have fond memories of GTA San Andreas. Well, we did, until the remake came along. Oh, oh that's, that's, that's a lot. Distracting. That is distracting. That's a lot of rain. Ugh. The one part of GTA San Andreas for which we weren't even a little bit nostalgic, however, was the stuff with the remote-controlled vehicles. In particular, the remote-controlled helicopter, which, as commenter Goldie Wahongi notes, was a legendary nightmare to manoeuvre. In the course of the game, CJ takes a break from doing serious crimes to do missions for Zero, the nerdy proprietor of a store that sells remote-controlled vehicles. Well done, Carl. Now leave. I must prepare for the battles ahead. Never have so few owed so many. Too little three... No, that's not it. What is it? I say CJ takes a break from serious crimes. You are still gunning down delivery boys, but here it's with a toy plane. Which is a legal grey area, I assume. Haha, <laughs> only three delivery boys left! These missions for Zero are strikes against his hated rival store owner Berkeley, which culminate in a high concept pitched battle between remote controlled vehicles. Berkeley's headquarters is across no man's land. I'll drive the bandit, you fly the goblin, and help any way you can. If I get the bandit into Berkeley's base, he must leave San Fierro for good. Let battle commence! In this mission, Zero drives an RC car across a dangerous mini battlefield, while you fly an RC helicopter to remove obstacles, place bridges, and protect Zero's car from being destroyed. Oh my god, Berkeley shot this bandit up pretty good! The remote-controlled helicopter handles about as well as you might expect of a dinky model chopper with a massive magnet stuck on it, which is to say, terribly. That plus the time limit plus Zero's dwindling health bar makes this a pretty stressful episode all round, not helped by the panicky commentary from David Cross. Carl, there's no bridge. There's no bridge! By the time you've cleared this frustrating sequence, you'll be fully ready for a return to car theft and murder. You know, the easy stuff. What I look for in a vehicle is comfort, economy, and five or six cup holders. I drink a lot of liquids. What has none of these things is the glass orb from Earthworm Jim, as suggested by commenter Jackalope Zero, because it's a glass orb. Yippee! Well, technically speaking, it's a bathysphere, a deep sea submersible encountered in the first aquatic level of the Mega Drive Classic, where you use it to navigate around the underwater base of Bob the Killer Goldfish. But to be transparent, haha, the bathysphere is actually a fragile glass bubble with fiddly thrusters that, depending on your aptitude for fiddly thrusters, contains either barely enough or not quite enough breathable air to get you from place to place without dying of asphyxiation. <laughs> Racing the clock to not die choking on a lack of oxygen? That's always fun. Said, I guess no one ever. If you don't run out of air first, the chances are good that you'll ping off the rock walls of this narrow tunnel system one too many times, cracking open the submarine's delicate dome and killing Jim in an underwater implosion. In actual science fact, earthworms can live underwater for several weeks because their skin can absorb oxygen from the water. Which proves that Earthworm Jim would be better off ditching this orb and going it alone, relying only on himself and nature's cup holders. Which is what I call hands. Father was right. We shouldn't have gone so deep. In Subnautica, you play the lone survivor of a spaceship crash on an ocean planet, whose quest for survival looks like the world's most intense scuba holiday. <laughs> to survive and thrive on this alien world, you will also need to construct equipment, and among your equipment options are various vehicles. 
dip into the Subnautica community chat and you'll find mixed opinions about a certain hover bike known as the Snow Fox, introduced in the standalone expansion Subnautica Below Zero. We can all agree that the Snow Fox looked rad as hell in the early trailer. But since then, assessments of this nippy land vehicle have somewhat diverged. Among the Snow Fox's critics is commenter Tails Greel, who submitted this one-person transport as a suboptimal means of conveyance on Subnautica's alien planet, what with its fiddliness and fragility. And although there are those who love razzing around on this sleek looking hover bike, there are plenty more turned off by its general inferiority to the much loved prawn suit. A versatile bipedal mech suit that doesn't leave you vulnerable to any old ice worm that wants to make a meal out of you. If we were just picking based on names, I'd be Snow Fox all the way. But despite it sounding like a seafood mascot costume, I'm gonna have to go with the prawn suit. <laughs> In the real world, squid attacks are rare because most potentially dangerous species live in the deep ocean, far away from me. Nice. In the world of Mario, on the other hand, attacks by bloopers are common because every single one of these ocean-dwelling squid equivalents wants to kill you and everyone you care about. Except, that is, for a very few special not-homicidal bloopers, such as these ones in Super Mario Sunshine, which have been tamed by local businessman Big Daddy and are apparently cool with you riding on their back. Wait, what's that about accidents? No time for that! Time for blooper surfing! As commenter Blood Runs Clear points out, blooper surfing involves mounting a hard-to-control blooper with a top speed ranging from fast to ludicrously fast based on your chosen colour, and if you crash into anything, you'll die instantly. So just like that time I rented a jet ski. To make sure you're having the most frustrating possible experience with blooper riding, you race your selected blooper against the clock, and Big Daddy's got a pretty harsh view on an acceptable lap time. <laughs> But push it too hard trying to beat the clock and you'll smash your blooper on an obstacle, at which point you'll lose a life and fail the race. You know what? I think I was actually safer with one of the ones that was trying to kill me. Oh hell, did you just leap over piss wash golly of one of my runners? Man, dude, tell me when you're gonna do that crap! That was awesome! There's a lot of ground to cover when you're a vault hunter, and if there's no fast travel terminal where you're going, your options are 1. Hoof it, or 2. Take a vehicle known as an outrunner, or runner, to its friends. These vehicles obtained from your friendly local catch-a-ride station are ostensibly a vault hunter's best friend, what with how they save you on shoe leather and come with their own weapon system. In the words of commenter the Alcalic, however, the Borderlands 1 runners seem to be constructed from the planet's flimsiest components and their onboard weaponry only a step or two above a large mounted nerf gun. This doesn't exactly give you the powerful edge in a combat encounter that you'd expect from being the one in a battle car. And if you manage to get your ride destroyed, you'll be looking at a fight for your life screen, followed, if you're lucky, with a jog back to the catcher ride station. Who's the runner now? It's me. Hi, I'm the runner, it's me. Taylor Swift, yeah? I'm Scooter, and this is my catcher ride. You can carry us that one way or the other. Vault drill, vault saint, flip a coin, say a prayer, whatever. Thank you for watching those were seven video game vehicles so rubbish we'd rather walk as suggested by our cherished commenters thank you so much for your comments um let's keep the good times rolling with this video from outside xbox which is about the seven video games that predicted your nonsense or this one from our sister channel outside extra which is about the bosses who became just regular enemies after you defeated them what a demotion um so enjoy one of those two and we'll see you next time on outside xbox for more videos like this <laughs>